This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we support design engineers and make lightning protection easy. You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Welcome back to the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, got a great lineup. First, we'll talk about the rather rather desperate pilot shortage that's now gripping uh, the U.S. and also globally. We'll talk about Rolls-Royce. They've been testing one of their electric generators, now exceeding one megawatt output, which is insane. We'll talk about uh, hydrogen-powered airliners. The U.K. has revealed a plan that they think they can make a a long-haul airliner work. We'll see if Alan agrees. Uh, We'll also chat a little bit through Elon Musk's views on the matter. Obviously, he has strong views on electric and hydrogen in the future in general, and his are a little bit controversial when it comes to hydrogen power. In our EVTOL segment, we'll talk a little bit more about Elon Musk. We'll talk about Archer, Ehang, Jetson One, uh, which their sort of hobbyist uh, aircraft have pretty much sold out by this point, and a little uh, story about Apple car engineers and how they're starting to flee the nearly $3 trillion company. So, Alan, let's start with this pilot shortage. I struggle to understand these things a little bit. Obviously, there's shortages of workers everywhere, but the world hasn't, I mean, the world has changed. But where did all the people go? Alan, why do we have such a pilot shortage? It seems like, you know, two years ago, life was relatively normal. Obviously, COVID was a big deal and still is. But how could we be desperate that many pilots at this point? It doesn't seem to add up to me. Well, when the when COVID hit, there was a lot of furloughs and pilots got laid off. And in that interim, and because it was long enough, it's been a year and a half, two years, going on two years now, that pilots are educated people. They can they can find jobs in other industries, and they did. And now that uh, some of them are being recalled back, they they don't want to go back in particular. Maybe they found a better paying job and they found a job with better better hours or less stress or a, a variety of variables there. And I, I, there, if you look at the TSA numbers, we're at about 85, 90 percent of 2019 level. So the, the flights, at least the flights in the United States, are pretty close to where we were. And that means there's a lot of airplanes flying internally into the United States overseas, not so much still. Uh, and those tend to be kind of the smaller airplanes, the 737s, Airbus A320s, 319s, uh, the, the 737 Maxes are, are going to be big in that space. Uh, and so the most senior people don't tend to fly those airplanes. It tends to be the, the, the towards the youngers, younger ages that are flying those airplanes. And I think they have other opportunities. And, and now that uh, the, the airlines are looking to expand and we have all the eVTOL pilots, Uber flight kind of pilots that are going to be needed. There's going to be a big demand on pilots. And I I don't know if we have the infrastructure to support it because 50 years ago, most pilots came out of the military. I think now it's not nearly that many come out of the military. They're they're coming out of places like Embry-Riddle and and schools like that or flight schools and, and they're just earning their wings over time by flying freight and cargo and all those different kind of airline airplane flights so you're just getting a different demographic coming into the marketplace uh, and the and the requirements for hours have gone up the FAA jumped the number of hours required so you could fly those particular airplanes has gone up so it's it's not easy just to find people and if they don't want to come back they want to come back and you're kind of stuck because the pool of new entrants is limited that's going to be a problem i really think it's going to be a problem and retirement i assume has also played into this not just uh like lat- lateral moves because the faa is having a problem with you know their senior engineers and all those uh folks also not coming back but retirement is playing into this i, I think retirement is playing into it i uh i think the covid Vaccine mandates played into it on some level. I think some people have left their jobs. We hear about we don't hear about that much in the press, but I know uh, hospital workers, people that are sort of uh, working federal jobs have quit. That would mean people at the FAA are probably quitting Uh, and airline pilots would be that other group. Right. That uh, would leave because of covid mandates. And you, you just can't really afford 
to have three, five, up to 10% of your workforce just walk out. And the FAA has a worse problem, right? The FAA, they're talking about like 50% of the engineers in retirement age by in the next couple of years. That's not good because <laughs> it does take time. I mean, there's something about having experience. Experience tends to lead to better outcomes um, just because you know where all the issues lie, right? So I, I don't know if the airline industry is really accounting for in particular, this EV tall market and what it's going to do on pilots, because at least for the, initially, we're not going to have autonomous flights like they do in, you know, like we're talking we're talking about in China. Uh, it's going to be piloted flights, so you're going to need a bunch of pilots to go do those things. And uh, you know, if you, if it's a comfortable, much more comfortable lifestyle, like if you're doing it in Los Angeles, you're not leaving Los Angeles, and you can go home at night every night. That may be a little more desirable than ending up in you know Poughkeepsie overnight. Just saying. Well, do you think EVTOL piloting would be in the same order? Because like you said, the FAA has increased hours. And it seems like from what we've heard with the Joby flight simulator, that these will be like a different order of like difficulty in flying. Like, do you need to be a seasoned commercial airline pilot to to be an EVTOL pilot? Obviously, you could go that direction. But uh, I mean, will the entrance standards be a lot easier to be a, you know, to pilot a, a Joby EVTOL in the future compared to a commercial airliner? I haven't looked at that specifically, but I think the answer is yes. Uh, just because of the number of passengers on the airplane, it'd be, it'd be like flying a charter flight, like a Cessna Citation or a Learjet when you have uh, a charter flight. They, uh, they operate under diff. I think they just operate under different rules than the airlines operate under. Uh, and there's different actual codes, or rules, regulations, laws that uh, different operators work under, different size operators work under. So, so I, I don't think that the Jobies and uh, the Archers of the world will have, they're not going to have the requirements of a 737 pilot, right? But a 737 pilot could clearly fly uh, a Joby, right? And But I, I think it comes to a question of lifestyle and airlines haven't competed with that, right? Airlines have not competed. What's, what's the alternative? You're going to fly cargo, you're going to fly sort of these business flights. And that's a different... Probably doesn't. It doesn't have as. Oh, it doesn't. Didn't used to have as rich as a pension. Um, some of the French benefits. Uh, you get. You're a captain on a triple seven. That's a pretty good gig. And I'm not, not sure the Jobies of the world ever get to that level. But there's other factors that play into it. Like if I want to see my family all the time and come home every night. That's a. People make lifestyle decisions like that, and and it will drive where the marketplace goes. So airlines may be in a little more of a pinch than they think. Well, if standards are, are very different, which it seems like, like you said, they probably will be, then you wonder if a lot of drone hobbyists would, you know, be able to like, hey, I'd like to fly one of those. And they sort of make the leap from like, you know, experienced drone pilot, obviously just, you know, handheld, like very different, but also not that different, right? That that would be a logical leap for the the growing pool of people who love flying drones in the U.S., yeah, well, I think the, the neat thing about drones today is that like the drone racing league that you see on ESPN every once in a while, uh, uh, it's a 3D experience, right? It isn't like you're flying a, a radio control airplane in the in the olden times. Uh, you actually have a, a, a visor on this headset. Headsets, right. You get a 3D view of what you're doing. So it is like you're flying in the pilot seat and like the Joby doesn't have any rudder pedals. Well, neither does the, the drone pilot, right? They just got these control sticks. And so their experience... Well, if they can meet the medical requirements and the vision, obviously vision requirements and health requirements, um, th that transition may be a lot easier than you would think. So it's 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 not out of the realm of possibility. I think if, if you're really interested in flying drones and you have been flying basically virtually all that time, yeah, it wouldn't be that much of a transition. Yeah. So moving on, Rolls-Royce, uh, they're excited. They've just broken through uh, one megawatt output in testing of their power generation system one. Uh, Alan, this is a lot of electricity. I mean, we talk about wind turbines on our other podcast and a megawatt is a significant amount of power. And their goal is to reach up to two and a half megawatts at some point in the future. Um, what what engine is going to need to gobble up that much power? And what are the implications for, for all that? Like, what's the difference between one megawatt and two and a half megawatts? Is that just more thrust? Is that more like they can fly at a higher speed or they can just go longer? Yes. <laughs> well, all the above, right? Yeah, all of them. The, the, it, I, they didn't really lay this out in the article very well, but I'll, I'll try to connect the dots here. I th what they were talking is about was hooking a 
turbo fan engine to a generator. And then my assumption was that, that they, they were going to drive electric motors that are spinning propellers or have some sort of thrust mechanism of some sort, turbo electric turbo fans or something of the sort, uh, so that they could, in a sense, use hydrogen. I mean, that, that's what it, it seemed like. Like they're going to, right now they're using Jet A or maybe sustainable fuels, right, uh, to power the jet engine to drive the generator and that generator will drive all the other stuff which i'm not sure weight wise that makes sense I mean, at least that's what i interpreted that to mean uh because there's just like in the hydrogen world there's like two different pathways that are going on right now basically take the existing jet engine and, and transform it into a uh, hydrogen burning engine but I think there's a lot of infrastructure problems with that. Like, how do you store the hydrogen? How do you get it to the engine? All that. It's so cold, right? You got all this piping. If things get brittle and they get that cold, what are you going to do there? And then the, the second way is, well, make all those motors, well, make them all electric motors instead of, instead of uh, engines, right? Make them all electrically driven uh, turbo fans, essentially, and then have a big generator in the back that's burning hydrogen in a much more condensed area that's controlled so you'd have a hydrogen tank or sustainable aircraft fuel driving a little apu kind of device which is turning a generator and that generator drives all the motors that would be out on the wing more than likely right and so i that's i think that's where it's going because there's just so much weirdly enough there's a lot of effort by Rolls and other companies looking at electric motors um because if, if you think about how much this 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 motor the generator they're talking about uh i think it says it's about the size of a beer keg yeah which is impressive right that's that's a lot i mean that's way beyond anything we would see in wind power but you know wind power one megawatts the size of a small car right so they've shoved a lot more energy in a much smaller package uh to cut the weight out and, and they're gonna have to have some cooling systems to do that uh so it's just really fascinating how much time and effort they're using to engineer a much smaller, compact, lighter, uh, more probably more durable generator than we would normally see in, in the wild here. Interesting. So moving on, uh, the UK's Aerospace uh, Technology Institute has unveiled a concept for a hydrogen powered long haul airliner. They think they can get up to 279 passengers on it and haul out to flights on up to a little over 5,000 nautical miles. So Alan, we've talked about hydrogen. That still seems to be a really difficult problem to solve. Uh, having read through this, what do you think about this project with uh, ATI? I think they got a, it's an interesting project that it's going to be really difficult to get done. And you only see the difficulty once you start digging down off the top level a little bit. The the hydrogen, I think conceptually, burning hydrogen or using hydrogen for propulsion, pretty straightforward, right? You can use burning the stuff. I think it really gets down to like, how are you going to store it? How are you going to keep it cold? How are you going to move it around? How are you going to burn it? Is it? What's the reliability of this thing? What kind of electronics do you need? Can electronics take the temperature extremes? Do you need to have a cooling system? Because uh, uh, there's just so many different variables to it. Yeah, right? I mean, it's a materials problem, like in the extreme. And it's uh, a reliability problem because we don't we haven't probably used some of these materials before. We don't know how they react in, in this uh, hydrogen world hydrogen embrittlement is a thing right and, and, and materials and metals and things so uh, there's just so many different aspects that we don't have any history on and you would like to like with aircraft you know the aircraft started with in, um, internal combustion engines which were used in autom automotive for years before they kind of really got going in airplanes and so we had some history we, we're not going to have any history with hydrogen before we stick it in airplanes what are what are the other uses of internal combustion engines or or turbo fan engines that are using hydrogen on the ground today I, I, even in generators for like power generators we don't use hydrogen for power generation so we don't really know anything about the reliability of that system and so don't you see like is that the place to be trying it with passengers or should it be like a military application or a drone application which would be my vote a drone application to make a lot of sense what's with loading it through of 200 people 
it just feels it just feels un- I'm not saying it's unsafe. Well, it feels unsafe because you just don't have the data. And then engineers love data. And right now you don't have any data and there's a lot of variables here. That's where you start to feel uncomfortable about it. And I think it's it's uh, I think engineers that would be working on that would have the same questions about it. Particularly the system safety people would just go, I don't know what to do here. Yeah, you don't. I want to throw another obviously influential voice into the mix. Uh, Elon Musk's views on hydrogen fuel cell powered cars are that he said it's uh, fool, fool cells was his, one of his tweets. He said that basically the best case, the best case fuel cell car uh, is not better than today's current case battery powered car. Um, now, is that generalizable to the skies? Obviously, especially in an airliner, there's a lot more space to put, uh, you know, like you said, the hydrogen storage, storage tanks, all that stuff where there's very limited space to put that in a, in a car. But first, I mean, taking a lateral leap, how do you feel about his views on hydrogen cars? Are they accurate? And, and again, I mean, our battery, is battery technology going to just catch up if hydrogen planes are 10 years away, 15, 20 years away? Are, is battery technology just going to maybe make that obsolete? I don't think battery power is ever going to get us to cr- cross an ocean. I'm just, so obviously, somebody, so there'll be some of today's Charles Lindbergh that will fly from uh, New York to, to Paris in an electric battery airplane. I'm, I'm waiting for that to happen, actually. That would be a really good, uh, you know, uh, Musk prize or an X prize or Google equi- Google prize, whatever they call those things, uh, to go do that because that's a long flight, right? And I think that's where the, where the problem lies in airplanes. They're just so energy intensive versus automobiles that... You just need so much more battery, which is why we're using fossil fuels, sustainable fuels, and let's talk about hydrogen, because the math doesn't work out for batteries right now, except for shorter flights. Well, here's a question. We obviously have these refueling tankers that fly in the sky and, you know, extend their uh, fueling. Could that be a thing with an electric cable? Could you just tap into a, a electric vehicle or electric plane and charge it up they fly linked for 30 minutes and just have a crazy high amperage or whatever it is to i mean is that would that be ever realistic to charge on the fly for military purposes i think absolutely if you had to do that yeah i, I think that would be doable it, whatever that refueling plane will look like I, it could just be like that ship you're we talking about the, the battery ship it'd be an airplane ship <laughs> Yeah, it'd be very similar to that. Um, I think militarily you could do that. If you have to be pulling a lot of current to go do that, but it, you know, if give it enough demand and requirements, yeah, you, I think you could do it. Uh, refueling a civilian airplane is a big no-no. There's too much chance for a problem to occur there. And if you're over the Atlantic Ocean and you can't mate up or something happens, do you just plumb it into the ocean? That's you know, yeah, not ideal. <laughs> well, moving on. So back to your thoughts on on uh, hydrogen. Yeah, I, the the hydrogen piece, an automotive, I think, is essentially dead. Uh, that happened ten years ago, and the batteries have caught up enough. And Tesla's demonstrated that severely enough across the United States and across the world that I think hydrogen is dead in automobiles. But that doesn't mean it's dead in other areas. Industrial equipment, big big uh, construction equipment. That may make total sense. Hydrogen may be a, an alternative there. We you know you've propane and buses and things in the United States for a long time. Yeah, so hydrogen may be that next piece. And and, and maybe it, it is in airplanes too. Uh, it, I, again, it's not going to be it's not going to be a you know a, a conceptual problem with hydrogen. It's really going to be all about the details of hydrogen and how you're going to Put a system, a reliable, repeatable, um, 20-year lifespan system together that um, has incredible, incredible reliability. You know, an accident once every billion hours sort of thing. That's that's a remarkable... If you just think about the requirements for airplanes right now and, and when you can have a quote-unquote catastrophic event... It's crazy the the reliability numbers that we've we've gotten to, unbelievable. I mean, unheard of. A hundred years ago, you would never ever think we would ever be able to put three hundred, four hundred people on an airplane and reliably fly them wherever they want. But we do it every day, and but we only do that through a lot of learned lessons and hard lessons. Hydrogen just introduces so many new technical challenges that I'm not 
sure when they make like 20, 30 deadlines or 20, 40 deadlines. It's going to be tough. Really, really hard to do that. And politicians make light of that because they're not doing it. Right? <laughs> you're not regulating it. You're not uh, designing it. You're not looking at the materials and the qualification and the testing and all the things that keep engineers up at night uh, and the infrastructure to make it happen. I, they just it's it's too easy of a word to throw around. And I think that's the issue with hydrogen right, right now. It just seems too perfect. And it is too perfect. Well, let's uh, get your quick take on one other Elon Musk tweet. So he's tweeted, I guess, a, a couple of times about supersonic EVTOLs. So we won't spend a lot of time here, but is this a possible thing? And would there even be a use case for it? No, and no. Uh, going supersonic, at least at this point, requires uh, burning fossil fuel in sort of like rocket mode. I think uh, maybe the F-35 can get to supersonic without that. But I mean, there, there, there's some portion of thrust, which is uh, the uh, explosive gas coming out the back end of the airplane to get it to go that fast. Uh, a fan really can't do that because you need fan rotation speeds that are faster than supersonic. And that doesn't really work well. I don't, no one's done it. <laughs> no one's done it. Uh, and... Yeah, you'd be breaking Mach numbers on the tips of these fans. And, I, and yeah, that, that would not, at least my general understanding of aerodynamics, like that's not really a thing you do. So it's really, I think it's impossible. Uh, and I haven't heard anybody say it's impossible, but I think it's kind of impossible. Uh, maybe an aerodynamics motor designer could say, oh, no, we could, we could if you had enough horsepower, <laughs> you could do it. I don't think so. I think that's maybe where the hydrogen comes in. Is <laughs> you just make yourself into a rocket and let go. But what, well, and like uh, the, the supersonic here, let's dive into the supersonic thing for a minute because there's a couple of projects going on supersonic right now. Boom. And there's one down in Atlanta going on right now. The, the use case and the, the, the economics of those have not really proven out. And, I, and Arion obviously folded during COVID times, which is down in Florida. The, the use case for supersonic just really hasn't been there except militarily. And I, I'm not sure that changing my flight from New York to London from five hours to three hours is such a huge difference. I'm willing to pay the extra to, to get that happen. The Concorde couldn't make that work. And that was... And, and regulated times, right? And when we conquered was around, the, the government regulated airline prices. In a free-for-all environment like we have now, an unregulated and, uh, economic environment on airlines, I'm not sure that, uh, basically you're talking about the elite. And I, I'm not sure there's enough elite to do that. It's from a company standpoint, to, to make the airplane and to comp thinking to produce like a thousand of these things, I don't see that as... Uh, a marketplace yet. I'd say it wouldn't develop, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Plus, when you start to talk about the elite, like why would they want to be on essentially like a like a commercial flight that's scheduled to take off with other people that they don't know on it when they could just again like oh, all right, this is going to shave two hours off my uh, transatlantic flight, but I have to be there on a certain time because it's a like a commercial flight rather than just take my private jet whenever I want in my in, in exceeding comfort, right? Like it. It probably wouldn't trump that, you know, like, why? Well, now I'm not going to spend $30,000 on a ticket to save two hours, and I got to be there at a certain time. I'm sure it would have its own little luxury port at the airport or something. But, you know, like, yeah, just take your just take your private jet at that point. You know, what? what's the difference? Right. Two more hours of luxury. You're like, OK, <laughs> sure, I'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. And the, the, the EVT all thing, yeah, I just couldn't think of a, a case where that, unless you're landing on an aircraft carrier, you know, what, what do you need to land this on where the vertical takeoff and landing matters? I, I couldn't figure out what that would what that would be. Plus, it would have to be big. Like, those planes are very long. Their, their fineness ratio is, is it it's a big ratio or a small ratio? Small, right? I think. Yeah, very long, very long. So, yeah, anyway, that was an interesting quick topic, but let's move on to, uh, to EHANG. So they're saying that they're hopeful they can achieve full type certification for their EH-216 in the next few months. Uh, of course, that's over in China and their uh, Civil Aviation Administration of China. Um, they think that the guiding principles uh, are going to get there and they're sort of moving ahead. So 
Alan, is this really going to happen as quickly as they say? Sure, why not? I, I, I don't see any reason why they won't do it. it, it it's more of a... It, the, the articles I've seen don't really talk about what the certification process is in China for this particular aircraft. Uh, but there's a lot of like anti-America, look, we beat America to the eVTOL market stuff. Like, why do you, why do you care? Right. <laughs> you got enough people in your own country that you, America doesn't make any difference here. Right. Uh, we're not, we're not snapping our pencils like, ah, they beat us. Like, yeah. Oh, you beat us to, to the moon. Uh, no, that's <laughs> nobody cares. Right. We're, we're busy tweeting and making TikToks right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're making the best electric cars in the world. Uh, that's what we're doing right now. And China's importing them. Uh, so, you know, one of the I think the the issue with Ehang is what they're going to have problems with is getting whatever they quote unquote certify in China to be applicable to the rest of the world. Are they going to export this aircraft? Are they going to uh, send it to, to Paris and to London and to Stockholm? I don't think so. I think the regulators in other countries will look at that very closely and decide that that wasn't adequate. And the, 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 the piece that I think is probably the most difficult for me watching it is they, they have videos of what I consider to be tourists, there's no pilot in the thing, right? So it's like two, two tourists and one of these airplanes, uh, drones, I guess, large drones, I call it, that are flying across water in promotional videos. You would never, ever see average people in, an air, in a flight test airplane. Uh, that's not going to happen uh, in a promotional video, <laughs> like Cessna's not doing that, right? <clears throat> just not how that works in flight test world because it's just too much risk, right? There's too much risk to put a random person in that airplane, and plus they don't only have a, don't have a pilot. It's all controlled by the ground, right? So there's no way if something were to go wrong, there's nothing that the people inside of it can do. It's it's over, and I I think that doesn't help. The transition to outside of China, I like. I, I don't see the Brazilians thinking, "Oh, that's a great way to certify it," and we'll we'll gladly take that that aircraft into Brazil, which could probably use it. Honestly, uh, that just makes everybody really reluctant. So I I don't understand the politics of this, and and let's just make clear that airplanes are poli political pieces in this bigger chess game that's being played. That. Uh, we, we've seen it a lot recently, and we'll talk about it later. But, you know, Ehang, great technology, cool, probably works great. Love it. Uh, cert, what certification means, I, I really don't know yet. Well, moving on, Archer is also uh, eyeing certification. Of course, it seems like they're just taking the same steps that, you know, jo Joby has uh, reached. But it says they have a special airworthiness certificate in hand and path to certification in sight. What does that mean? I think it just means he's allowed to do flight testing. I think that's what they're saying. Uh, there's a lot of little manufacturing quality pieces before you go flight test. Um, if you're doing a conforming flight test, like you got a conforming vehicle, then the FAA is going to go look at the aircraft, make sure all the pieces are right, and then it's been built like the drawings say it's going to be built, and it's it complies with the aircraft design on paper or on the computer. That's most of it. And the Archer, the Archer piece, I think, is interesting because... Uh, the speed at which they're moving and the, the people which they brought on to support the project. If you, if you look at Joby, if you look at Beta, if you look at Whisk, Kitty Hawk, uh, I could probably name a couple others. They've been working on this. We've been working on these aircraft for like mm, five, 10 years ish, right? Like Beta went through a number of iterations before it got to where it is today. Whisk it went through a number of iterations before they got to where they are today. Uh, Joby went through a number of iterations before they got to where they are today. Name that name the development cycle in Archer. Like how long has the development cycle been in Archer? A year? Maybe? Two years? It's been no, it's not, it's been not that long. And and the the little you know bell that goes off in the back of your head is like, man, this is moving really fast. Did they miss something? That's the concern I think that the FAA would have is like, okay, this thing's really rocking along and I'm sure it's being super aggressive because of the financial stakes that are involved with it. Is it right? 
And and Arch is going to fall right in the middle of this FAA exercise that's going on right now where they're being uh, extra cautious with delegates and conformity, and quality, and making with the with all the Boeing stuff that's happening. The FAA is not going to let or is going to be very reluctant to to um, accelerate any aircraft program just because the investors are antsy. The FAA shouldn't care, and and I hope that they don't. And it, it, it to me, just watching from the outside, it's like okay, the Joby thing I get, the Beta I get, uh, Kitty Hawk, Whisk, all those other ones I get because they're on that normal development cycle. Archer's not on that same pathway. So what are we going to see when they get to flight test? Not sure. Hopefully it goes well. I mean that's the goal is all this stuff goes really well, but it doesn't feel right to me right now. Um, Hopefully, prove me wrong. Well, there's definitely a lot of buzz about it. And so you can imagine that all these companies are trying to get to market as quick as they can. Speaking of which, uh, the Jetson 1, which is one of these personal $92,000 experimental aircrafts that we reported on, you know, a bunch of months ago, it says they've pretty much sold out, which was not a large run. It sounds like um, upwards of 60 orders have been placed, but that's, you know, a small company. So that seems like that's about tapping them out. Does this surprise you that this that this um, has sold out that quickly? That there was so much interest? It doesn't surprise me. I, you know, it seems like there's enough rich people who would love an, a cool new toy. Right, right. You got eight billion people on the planet. You can find a couple hundred to buy an aircraft. Typically, right? <laughs> it just comes on the other side of economics. Do you have the cash to buy the materials to make the thing and deliver it? And then do you use use those proceeds from that first sale to fund the next airplane? That's because that's the way it works, right? You sell the first airplane so you can make airplane five. <laughs> it's that kind of continual flushing of cash. Ask Tesla how that goes, right? It's that you need the cash to build the next set of airplanes or cars. Uh, and so that's why you see the build rates probably so low. And that in order to get to higher build rates, they'd have to invest in a lot of tooling and infrastructure, which they don't want to do because they're concerned that the at the, the first accident or there's something that happens that they could lose their shirt. And so if they're being really smart about this. I've got to give them some credit. Like the airplane's cool. I like the way they put some guards around the propellers. I don't know if you saw that last, last video, Dan. They got actually some guards around the propellers, which it feels better to me, a little bit better. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think they're, they're thinking about what the marketplace is, is also thinking. Uh, but they're also being very cautious. It's like they're bootstrapping this design in and, and the company so that they don't go bankrupt, that they're going to make a little bit of money, uh, get a product out there, and then... If it all works well, then Gen Two will happen, right? And that's the goal: to get to the next, get to the next one, get to the next one, and then maybe you have an airplane company. Yeah, cool. So, last on the docket today, uh, Apple has lost some talented engineers to the EVTOL market. So they've been having, obviously, Apple uh, attracts top talent, whether it's design, engineering, whatever. And they had some pretty good uh, people on their Apple car project, but it seems like they've had a lot of difficulties retaining some of them. And, you know, Apple's very secret, a very secretive company, so we don't know what's been going on behind the scenes, but we do know that a handful have left. Eric Rogers, who is a former uh, chief engineer for Radar Systems, is now at Joby. Uh, Alex Clarebutt went from hardware engineering to uh, engineering manager of battery systems at Archer. Uh, Steven Spiteri is now uh, Archer's power electronics manager. So people are moving laterally. Of course, you know, this always happens in every industry. People move jobs, et cetera. But this is being reported like it seems like maybe there's a little bit of an exodus and maybe this Apple car project isn't coming to fruition as fast as people would like. And they're seeing maybe something better in EVTOL. What's, what's your take here? Yeah, the Apple car situation has been really odd the last well i think covid really affected it in terms of the marketplace and the ability to dump to dump cash into that project the car design i've seen bits and pieces of the car design uh starting about three years ago and at that point it was kind of developed uh but i figured I, the, t the timeline for it was never really established and tim cook never really said anything about the project that was definitive uh so i'm wondering if apple's going to eventually shut that thing down I, you know the, the 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 kicker on the airplane side when everybody moves over to the airplane side because they want to stay in the silicon valley region which is where archer and joby and these companies are 
next to where the, the investment money is, uh, they're walking into a completely different world, right? Designing automobiles or designing battery packs or designing radar systems on a, on a vehicle on the ground is not the same as designing them and using them in an aviation. The requirements are totally different and the system safety aspects are, are majorly different because someone's going to hold you accountable to them. You have to demonstrate them and you have to demonstrate this crazy high reliability uh, that uh, there's a learning curve there and it's not immediate. And when I've seen people make the transition from automotive to aerospace, it does take a year or two to kind of get acclimated to all the stuff that has to happen and all like, why do I have to have some, somebody come and look at my part that I just built before I go off to test? Well, that's the way that system works. Right. Uh, or why did, why do I have to have this engineer sitting here watching my testing go on? Yeah. Because that's the way the FAA told you it's going to go. Right. And it, it works opposite from aerospace to automotive. If you go from aerospace to automotive, it's like, I can do a lot of things that I can't do in airplanes. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I can tighten the bolts on this on this uh, car. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't do that on an airplane. No, you cannot, right? It's, so it's just a different, it's just a whole different level of uh, oversight. And it just, and when I think that, when I think they want to bring people in who've been experts in one particular automotive or computer field and i bring them in as a manager to a bunch of airplane engineers the success rate for that is has not been tremendously high from what i've seen uh it's been well below average and it, just because there's so much to to learn like all the all the engineers know what all these little details are that they're going to have to go do and yet they're managed by somebody who doesn't know anything really little about what the faa world is telling them and so you have to not only do your job but you're training this guy who's your supervisor or or not guy but person who's your supervisor that's not what you want to be doing there right you you got enough on your plate designing the aircraft then you got to go teach somebody else like what's going on that's just not maybe not a very good use of resource if they come in as a technical expert like if they're doing battery design and they're going to help you on, the, on just on the battery design forget about certification awesome put a put them in the technical side and leave them over there but it's when you start to cross pollinate the technical people with the certification people where uh, so, you know, nuclear fission just starts to happen. And it, it doesn't always go the way you want it to. So then that's, that's, I think that's what the concern is. So it's, it, you know, the Apple project may be dead, but the transition to airplanes is not going to be easy. Yeah. I th I th it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Apple car because Apple doesn't typically enter markets second, right? Or if they do, it's for some peripheral thing, like their headphones. I mean, they obviously have had wild success with their, Air their AirPods. Uh, because of their brand clout, so they know they can sort of push, you know, barrel through and make a hole for their products. But their AirPods were also like kind of game changing a little bit, right? Um, but as far as the Apple car, you wonder if they can really barrel into that market and have the same clout with Tesla there. Because Tesla has that similar high quality, prestigious, trendy, well designed, and market leader first, you know, first into that market really. So yeah, you wonder if Apple's kind of like, eh, maybe this isn't worth the resources. Full self-drive, Dan, I think the full self-drive is the real game changer, changer there. And that I think Apple was looking at the full self-drive, so was Google. But Tesla has basically opened that up in the last week or two, right? The full self-drive and, and some beta version of the computer system that they have. And, and they're letting people with like perfect driving records do full self-drive. That's the holy grail. And if Tesla's there, then why would you build a billion dollar factory to make a car if Tesla's, it's going to take you too long to get, and you're right. I think you're totally right about that. It's going to take you too long to get to market and you spend a bunch of money and it's not a marketplace that you have been before. So if you're not the first one in like Tesla is now, you will always be second. So Tesla's going to own 50% plus the market, probably 70% of the marketplace, no matter who comes in next they're just not going to own that space. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen. Leave us a review, share with a friend, and we'll see you here next week on Struck. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. 
If you need help with your radon lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardarrow.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.